This year, we've, uh, we've asked a guest to be with us um, that is really a living example of someone that we could model and wa- follow our lives after. Um, I've known about Bob Roberts for many, many years, and just be seated there. Don't be coming up early. Last night, he came up and didn't let me finish um, uh, my, my introduction. <laughs> uh, I've known about him for many years. I mentioned last night that my wife, Jessica, when she was a teenager, was on a missions trip to the Philippines, and he was the missionary that they were supporting. And so we go way back, even though last night was the first time I actually shook his hand and said hello face to face. Um, uh, Every year when it comes to missions time, I'm asking people that I trust, who who have you brought in to really motivate your people? Who is a good example? Who is someone that we could trust? Um, And Bob Roberts' name really for the last couple years has kind of come up. And last year I contacted him, and uh, he only does this a few times a year. He pastors a church in Grand Blank uh, in the middle of the state. Uh, But we are grateful this morning to have him. And church, I just want you to give him a warm welcome and uh, let's just welcome Bob Roberts. Thank you for coming. We love you already. God bless you. Let the Lord use you this morning. Amen. Thank you so much. Hey, it's great to be here. Fun last night. They had cheesecake. I'm a diabetic. Couldn't eat it. Dreamt about it all night. But uh, it was it was wonderful. Pastor's uh, piece of cheesecake. 1,100, 1,300 cal- 1300 calories. Yeah, <laughs> we almost lost him. What a joy to be here. A uh, couple things. Sue, wor- Sue just did the, uh, who was Cindy did the announcement, right, for the shoe box. Great job. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make a commitment. If you get 100 shoe boxes, our church will send you $1,000 for missions. Okay? If you get 99, you get nothing. <laughs> so 100 shoe boxes, our church will send $1,000 to your missions department, okay? You did a great job. Hey, my wife had a book published uh, probably six months ago. It's called Hillbrook New Beginnings, a Christian Fiction. It has done remarkably well. Um, the reviews have been great. The sales have been shocking. I brought some books today. They're normally $10. Today they're free. So if you want one and you love to read, take one. I, I hid some under the table for the second service. So they're free. Just take them and when you're done reading, pass it on. You know, you have a great pastor. Uh, he is a great preacher. The last thing, I go ahead, give him a hand. <laughs> the last thing you need me to do is try to out-preach him. I'm not going to do that. So I thought instead of preaching today, I'd like to talk to you. Is that okay? So let's turn to Second Samuel 24. Second Samuel chapter 24. Verse 24, David is coming to the close of his ministry, and he wants to make an offering to Yahweh. The context of our verse is this. David makes his way to the threshing floor. It's there that he will select an offering to the Lord. As he walks in, the owner of the threshing floor is shocked. Standing before him is the king of Israel. He humbles himself, and he says to King David, I'm so honored that you're here. I want you to go through all that I have, and whatever you find that you want to offer to the Lord, take it. It's free. Look what David said in verse 24. But the king replied, No, I insist on paying you for it. I will not sacrifice, I will not offer to the Lord, my God, burnt offerings that cost me nothing. I will not offer burnt offerings which cost me nothing. David understands the value of not simply giving, but sacrificial giving. In the New Testament, Jesus lifts one person up and puts them on display as the person that gave the most. Oddly enough, it's a widow that gave two pennies. But he said her giving came out of her need, not out of her abundance. Something happens in the equation of of giving to God sacrificially that doesn't happen simply by tipping God something. The hand of God will be extended in a supernatural way when your gift is given sacrificially. I will not offer to my God that which cost me nothing. We had just arrived in the Philippines. 
my three children, my wife, and myself, we moved to Negros, which is in the Visayas. There are 710 islands where people live. We were right in the middle. Our island was considered at that time and still continues to be one of the poorest in which people live. I would be the first missionary there in 13 years. My daughter, who was only two and a half when we arrived, was the only blonde on the island. Uh, she was special to the Filipinos. What's interesting, I was only there a few days when the Philippine Assembly of God Superintendent of the Visayas came to me and said, sir, welcome to the Philippines. I said, I'm thrilled to be here. He said, there's a place in San Carlos we want you to go. We want to establish a church there. I didn't know anything about San Carlos. I said, what will I do? He said, you will hold crusades seven nights. And at the end of seven nights, God will have given birth to a Pentecostal church. You would love San Carlos. At that time, there was about 100,000 people that called it home, but it was uniquely divided. Uh, this side had running water and electricity. This side had some pumps, but no electricity. On this side, we could not find one <laughs> evangelical church. So the first night, I held crusade, and they came. I preached. We prayed. We laid hands on the sick. We gave an altar call. God did amazing things. But the strength of my ministry was not at night behind a pulpit. The strength was walking during the day in the barangay. Uh, a barangay is a cluster of homes, uh, 10,000, 20,000 where people live. Their houses are identical. Eight foot by 10 foot, dirt floor, bamboo walls, bamboo roof. Uh, pressed together, I could extend my arms, turn in a circle. I could touch three or four of them. Uh, I didn't realize it at the time. But for many of them, I was the first American they had ever seen personally. They had seen posters of Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sylvester Stallone, <laughs> and I showed up. <laughs> As I walked, I would often have 50 to 100 Filipino adults around me asking me questions. The number one question back then was this, do you know Magic Johnson? I said, no, but I know one greater than magic. If you come tonight, I'll tell you about him. His name is Jesus. Talking to the adults, maybe 75, 80 of them around me, I looked up and I saw her coming in the back of the group. She was weaving her way through the crowd. She was carrying babies. I found out later they were identical twins, 16 months old. I'd never... I had never been prepared for what I was about ready to see. And she brought them up to me, and in my mind, I know this doesn't make sense to you. I assumed that she had secured a camera, and she wanted an American to hold the babies while she took a picture. I extended my arms, and she laid them in my arms, and I realized I had never seen children like this, severely malnourished, third degree. I sat deep into the socket, cheeks sunken in, color of their skin was distorted. They literally never blinked. It looked like somebody had taken skin and stretched it around bones, and I held them on my arms, and my heart broke, and I, I kissed this one on the forehead and this one on the forehead, and I prayed for them. I looked up with a smile, assuming the camera was ready, but there was no camera. Instead, this lady looked at me and spoke to me in Cebuano and said, Sir, I have just given you my babies. I said, Mom, I cannot take your babies. She said, if you don't take them, they'll die. I just buried their brother. Two weeks later, I stood next to a small wooden casket that most of you wouldn't have buried your pet in. The ends didn't meet. There were nails sticking out. The coffin wasn't painted. I lifted the lid and looked down into the face of a little boy, eight or nine, caused of deathless malnourishment. For two weeks of my life, God allowed me to see what others didn't see. I heard what others didn't hear, and God broke my heart. In our place in Bacolod, we had a two-story home, and I went upstairs, and I cleared out the closet. I put a blanket down there, and I would meet with God there every day and weep and pray in the spirit. I would weep so hard that it felt like I was going to literally throw up. I told God I wasn't prepared for this. I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to go outside. I didn't want to move. I needed God to help me. In the second week, I felt God spoke to me that he wanted me to start a feeding program. And as we started the feeding program, we would establish a church. I came downstairs and told my wife, and she was excited. She said, what's it going to look like? I said, I have no idea. 
I went to the Assembly of God superintendent and met with him and the presbyters and explained this is what I felt God speak to my heart. And they smiled and said, this is from God. Our island is in desperate need, and we must establish churches. They said, the place we want to you to work is Ponte Vedra. And then they said this, the man we want you to work with is Daniel Sarabia. I must have smiled from here to here. Daniel was my closest Filipino friend. He pastored a church just about uh, 20 kilometers away. His church was the most beautiful building on our city, in our city. It was absolutely great. You're not going to believe it. His church building was bigger than this. It didn't have NEPA walls. It had block walls. It didn't have NEPA roof. It had sheet metal. You're not going to believe this. It didn't have a dirt floor. <laughs> it had cement. It was the pride of Bacolod. And my friend Daniel pastored it. And they asked me to work with Daniel. I contacted Daniel. I said, come to my house. He came to my house on a Saturday. I said, Daniel, this is what God is saying. This is what the, the, the leadership team wants us to do. Daniel was excited, but he said the same thing. Everybody else had said, what's it going to look like? And I said, I don't know. When I said, I don't know, the doorbell rang. Isn't that amazing how God knows when to ring the doorbell? I got up and went to the door. There stood a four foot eleven. Filipina, dressed in a nurse's uniform. I looked at her and she said, are you Pastor Roberts? I said, yes. Are you going to start a feeding program? I said, yes. She said, my name is Cora Roviti. I am a nurse for the Philippine government. God told me to quit my job with the Philippine government. I should work for you free for one year. When I heard free, I said, you're hired. <laughs> Cora came in. What a gift from God. Cora, my wife, began to meet with doctors and dentists on the island. We met with an illustrator because many of our people are illiterate there. And she developed 12 health care lessons that will help the parents be better parents. Beverly and Cora met with Sunday school workers, and together they developed a curriculum that could be taught for 12 weeks every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, using puppets and using uh, Betty Lucan's flannel graph stories and using uh, color illustrations. Daniel developed 12 Bible lessons for the adults. Once everything was printed and brought together, I told Daniel and Cora, next Saturday we will begin, and we will go to Ponte Vedra. I said, Daniel, come to my house at 7 o'clock. Cora, you will come at 9 o'clock. Daniel came two hours early. I met him at the porch. I said, today's the day. He said, sir, today is the day. I said, Daniel, I want you to go to Ponte Vedra two hours early, early, early. He said, why should I go early? And I said it out loud. I was a little embarrassed. I said, I want you to be my spy. Moses had spies. Joshua had spies. I only wanted one spy. And there on my porch, I laid hands on him. And I'm telling you right now, I prayed the greatest prayer anyone's ever prayed over a spy. When I lifted my hands, I was so proud. Daniel was so excited, he jumped off my porch, made two steps, turned around and said, what's a spy supposed to do? <laughs> I said, I don't know. But I said, we will meet you at about 11 o'clock under the mango tree in city proper. And off he went. As he went, I felt so good. Cora arrived and I told her my dilemma. I said, Cora, I said, I've exhausted my resources with other ministries. I think I have enough many money to bring in 20 children. There are going to be hundreds. How will we select only 20 when there's hundreds? She said it to me. We will qui quietly walk in the barangay. And what we will do is that we will look for children that are malnourished. I'll ask to meet with them and their parents alone. I'll examine them. If the third degree, we'll bring them in. When we get 20, we'll stop. I said, you're brilliant. Beverly, Cora, and I got into our car and drove to Ponte Vedra. When we arrived under the mango tree stood my spy with over 200 mothers. And I had enough money for 20 children. I was angry with my spy. I got out of the car and I was so ticked I couldn't speak a word any longer. I called him over and in English I said this to him and what burned me the most, he was smiling. I said, what did you tell these people? And he spoke back in English very slowly. I told them God is able to meet their need. What do you do with a spy like that? <laughs> I said, okay. 
we didn't uh, examine 20. We examined hundreds of children. We didn't bring in 20. We brought in 40. I met with about 157 mothers in Sadwala Quattro. I've exhausted my resources. I said, these children will be in the program so good old 12 weeks. When they make their way to graduate, your child will be brought in. No one cursed, no one murmured. They all said the same thing. Marami Salamat Paul, thank you very much. We understand. They grabbed their bath of their child and went home. I had probably 37 mothers. I had some dads. And here's what I told them. Your child has been examined, and he or she is severely malnourished. They already knew that. But I said, starting Monday, under this mango tree, there will be a NEPA covering. There will be a long table, and there will be benches. You will bring your child here on Monday, but he or she must bring their own plate, their own glass, and their own spoon. And I said, Monday, we will deworm your child. All of our children and all of our missionaries in the Philippines have worms. I said, we will give them a vitamin every day. That was unthinkable. You could not buy a vitamin on my island, and I was going to give them a vitamin every day. I said, we will give them the best food of the day, rice, protein, pr frutas, fruit, and drink. Then we will have the children will do a Bible lesson every day. They will reinforce it with coloring. Many of the children had never even colored before, and they went home. Sunday passed, and then we had the covering built. On Monday, they came. I wish you could have been there. You could see them coming down the dirty roads, walking, carrying their plate and their spoon and their glass. The children came up and were seated on the benches. According to their weight, our nurse dewormed them, and then we gave them a vitamin. Then we gave them their food. When we lifted the lids, they couldn't believe their eyes. They had never seen so much food. The little three- and four-year-olds often would dip their, their spoon right into the rice of their plate, and instead of going to their mouth when no one was looking, they'd put it in their pocket, and then back to their mouth and back, bulging pockets of rice. They will take it home. It was okay. We had enough. We did the Bible lesson. It wouldn't work here, but back then it did. It was Betty Lucan's flannel graph. Anybody remember that? The children... <laughs> The children watched it look like a Steven Spielberg IMAX production. <laughs> they were motionless. After the Bible lesson, we had them color, and the parents would hover over them. And the hands of the child would literally at times be shaking as the parent would say, not over the line, not over the line. And he would color, and I would walk up and say, that's so beautiful. I'd put my hand on their back and tell them how wonderful it was. And when we were all done, we taught them a song, and then we said, you will come tomorrow. We would do it again. They couldn't believe it. Tuesday came, they came, and when they were seated, we separated the parents, and Cora taught them a health care lesson. Wednesday, they came, and the children we ministered to. Thursday, we ministered to the children, did the same cycle, but this time Daniel separated them and did lesson number one, God's in love with you. They really liked it. We completed this cycle, and on the fourth week, Daniel said, this week I will give an altar call. I was excited, and we prayed. Uh, the day of that Thursday, the fourth week, it was windy, and I knew that men couldn't go out fishing in their banca boats. We would have more men there than normal. In fact, we were the only show in town, so men that didn't even have children in the feeding program would come. I came early. I watched many of them were drinking coconut alcohol out of quart jars and smoking. We separated the parents. They went over here. Daniel began to teach. I stood in the distance not to draw attention to myself and prayed. When Daniel began to teach, the Holy Ghost fell on Ponte Vitra. I watched men take their alcohol and hide it behind palm trees. I watched them put out their cigarettes. And then Daniel taught. And Daniel gave an altar call. And let me tell you, you've never heard an altar call like his. Here's what he said. With every eye open and everyone looking around. If you know that you know you're not right with God and you want to be right, you know your name's not found in the Lamb's Book of Life and you want it to be, I want you to stand right now. And 73 adults stood. <laughs> and then to make it even more difficult, he said this, if you're serious about what you've just said you want to do, I want you to walk down here and face me. And his wife came next and face us right now. All 73 came down. 
Daniel and his wife laid hands on each one of them and prayed. My heart was broken as I seen what God was doing. I went up to Daniel afterwards and I said, isn't it wonderful? He said, sir, we have a problem. I said, what is the problem, Daniel? We have 73 people saved. That is the problem, he said. They don't have a full-time pastor. I only come here on Thursday. We don't have a church to meet in. We only meet under the Nipah when it rains and the wind blows. We cannot even meet. I said, what should we do? And he shocked me. He said, my wife and I will resign our church and I will become their pastor. I said, where will you live? I will sleep on the parishioner's floor in the bamboo until the Lord provides. And then I pressed it and said, how will you eat? And he looked at me and he said, Bob, I'm not your responsibility. I'm God's. He sent ravens to feed a prophet. He knows where I'm staying. He will take care of me. And to my amazement, Daniel resigned the nicest church on our island to work with 73 newborn spiritual babies and slept on the floor of bamboo of a parishioner. About a month later, he showed up at my house. He was smiling. I've since discovered when he's smiling, I'm in trouble. I just don't know it. <laughs> he said, we found it. I didn't even know we had lost it. I said, what have we found? In Ponte Vedra, sir, there's a building for sale. It's block wall, sheet metal roof, it's cement floor. It's, it's very big, big enough for the feeding, big enough for the parsonage, big enough for the church. There's a well where people must come to pump their water. Sir, it's for sale. I said, Todd Pila, how much? He said, I don't know. We got in the car and we drove all the way there, dreaming of what God could do with that facility. When we walked inside, the owner was on the second, uh, second uh, thing of chairs. He had a group of chairs by a table with two of his friends. I walked up. What do you think happened to the price when he saw an American was there? You have no idea. It was so ridiculously high. I said to him in Ilongo, I only want to buy this place, not the whole barangay. Oh, he said, this is great. It's sheet metal roof. It has block walls, cement floor. It has water. I said, I know that. We discussed it back and forth. And maybe he had been drinking. Maybe he had trying to show off in front of his two friends. But he did something Filipinos never do. He stood up, walked over to me, shoved a finger in front of my face and said loudly, that's my final offer, take it or leave it. That's not how Filipinos speak. I said, mahal. Marami salamat po, but no, it's too expensive. I thanked him and we left. For the first time, I saw Daniel looked a little discouraged. I said, Daniel, he said, sir, the Lord will take care of it. And he went home. I got in the car and I prayed and said, God, this is your church. This is your pastor. These are your people. They need a place, please. I started the car and went two blocks when the barangay president stopped me, the most powerful political leader in the barangay. I rolled down my window. She greeted me and said, hello. I said, hello. She said, you're not going to buy that building, are you? I said, I don't think so. Why? She said, don't. I said, why? She said, that building has evil spirits. I said, are you sure? Everybody knows. Don't buy it. I thanked her, and I pulled a U-turn. I went right back into the building alone, and there sat the owner with his two friends. He smiled because he assumed his negotiations had paid off flawlessly. And I did something my mama would be ashamed of me. I went up to him, and I took this finger and shoved it in his face, and it was shaking. I don't know if that was God or not, but it felt so good, I didn't care. <laughs> and I said, how dare you? You've tried to sell me a building that has evil spirits. And then I said, no one will ever buy this building. Who told you, he said, he asked. I said, the barangay president. And I repeated, no one will ever buy your building. I removed my hand, and he stood up. He shuffled his feet, and he said, Pastor, I will be honest with you. There are evil spirits, but only a few. I said, sell me the building. I'll take care of the evil spirits. We shook hands. I said, in 14 days, I will return with 3,000 US dollars. I bought the building, the lot, and the pump, and the water. I got in my car. I do not sing. 
uh, Bobby's team is great up here. I couldn't be part of that team. That day, I sang so well, you would have bought my CD. <laughs> when I got home, I went right into the house. I found Beverly, and I sang. Bought it, bought it, bought it. <laughs> and she sang back, got no money, got no money, got no money. <laughs> I didn't have $3,000. I didn't have $300. I had negotiated and never once considered how to pay for it. I'm not saying that's wise, but I am telling you this. The real question is, does God want it done? Not how much is it? But in that kitchen, my countenance collapsed. I was ashamed. I was embarrassed. I felt my ministry was at stake. I was trying to scheme how I could come up with $3,000, who I could possibly call in the United States to loan it to me. There was an overwhelming sense of pain. My wife, God bless her, she's in the back of the book. She's a great lady. She came up, took her hand, patted me on the back and said, the Lord, I said, don't. You've sucked all the air out of this balloon. Don't speak to me right now. I was panicking. But in the kitchen, God did something for me that as far as I know, he's only done one time. He gave me the gift of faith. I didn't ask for it. I wasn't looking for it. I certainly didn't deserve it. But in a moment's time, I knew that I knew that I knew that I knew God was going to take care of this. I looked at my wife and I said, God's going to take care of it. She thought I was in complete denial. But I said, no, but we're not going to discuss this, Bev. I know, I know, I know. I can't tell you how. I know, I know that God's going to take care of it. I raised up both hands and worshiped God. She thought, he has cracked, finally. Later that night, she tried to talk to me. I said, no, 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 no. God's going to take care of it. Three days later, I went to the post office, only missionary there. All my mail was open. Not only was it open, the postmaster guy who gave me my mail not only opened it, somebody from the UP sent my wife a $10 check for her birthday. He cashed it. You sent me cash, he spent it. You sent me gum, he chewed it. I wrote one of my friends a letter in Michigan and said, you will not understand this, but please send me some x lax <laughs> Of all countries in the world where you don't need x lax <laughs> Philippines is one of them. I wanted him to chew it. I wanted him to miss several days of work trying to figure out what was wrong. <laughs> I got a stack of letters like this. They were all opened. Took them home, all but one. Got home, and this one wasn't open. Opened it up, and here's what it said. Dear Brother Roberts, greetings in the name of the Lord. Just examined our missions account, found we had an excess of $3,000 enclosed as a check. Use it as the Lord sees fit. God sent the check before I negotiated. Well, the feeding program has increased from 40 children a day to 2,000. From one volunteer nurse to 38. We have seen hundreds of churches planted. How does that happen? I, I think it happens because a four foot eleven nurse gave up her salary for a year. And God responded. I think it happened because a pastor and his wife left a prestigious, secure church to live on the bamboo floor. And God saw the gift of sacrificial giving. When God sees sacrificial giving, his hand is extended in miraculous ways. Let me close with this story. The last few years of my missions, I had to raise about a million dollars a year. And the first thing I settled at an altar was this. I would not let the size of a church determine if I would go there or not. So I had a church call me and they said, we know you're busy, but wonder if you could come. I said, love to come. We worked on a date and settled on a date, and then the phone got quiet. He said, there's no hotels where we live. I thought, I've been there before. And then he said, I said, well, is there a floor you could maybe put a blanket and a pillow? I can do good on that. He said, oh, no, we can do better than that. We'll kick one of the kids out of their bedrooms. You'll have your own place. I said, okay, sounds good. When I pulled up, it was a small church in the middle of nowhere. And the house was a parsonage. That can be a gift or a curse, depending if the church has finances. This one didn't. 
they had duct tape under the window seal to kind of keep the cool air and the bugs outside or something. I noticed the 10 or 11 year old, the oldest boy had duct tape around his shoe to keep it from opening. There was a younger boy and then two younger girls. Those kids were unbelievable. They were the best. House was spotlessly clean. They treated me like a king. We sat down for dinner and the three kids began asking me questions. What's Christmas like? What's this like? What's they said, what's the weirdest thing you've ever eaten? I said, dog? You've eaten dog? Oh, what's it taste like? <laughs> I said, just like cat. <laughs> this continued all through the meal until finally the pastor's wife said, listen, give Brother Roberts a rest. Go get ready for bed. So they brushed their teeth, got their jammies on. The two little girls came out uh, on each side, they gave me a kiss. It broke my heart. They'd won me over for the rest of my life. They went to bed, and then the parents stayed up, and I don't know why I started talking about the garbage dump, 600,000 people that live there and how they go through the garbage six days a week looking for something to eat or to sell or to use, and uh, went to bed. I prayed and said, God, I bless this family, please. And my heart literally just broke that night. Uh, got up in the morning, pastor greeted me and said, never ask a missionary to do this before, so you don't have to, but if you'd tell our congregation about the garbage dump, that'd be great. I said, sure. So he introduced me, and I just began speaking. They had pews, and on the back pew was pastor's wife with the four-year-old. She was standing, the four-year-old, holding her mom's neck. I, I hadn't begun speaking more than 60 seconds when I noticed the mother was crying. Within 10 minutes, she was sobbing. Her hands were buried in her hanky. Her back was going up and down. The little girl was rubbing her mom's back, stared at me, almost saying, stop it. But I wasn't doing it. God was. I closed the service and had everybody closed their eyes. The, the wife got up and ran down, met me right here in the middle of the aisle, grabbed my hand, put something in it, went back and sat down, sobbing. I looked at my hand. I couldn't believe my eyes. It was her wedding ring. God was speaking to her to give, but she literally didn't have anything to give. In my mind, I thought, I'll give this back to pastor after the service. After the service, I looked for pastor. I found him in his office. His back was to me. He was crying. Without saying a word, he turned around, reached up, and handed me his ring. I said, I have your wife's ring. I can't take it. And through his tears, he laughed. He said, we have not talked. This must be God. I said, I don't take rings. He said, oh, they're not for you. They're for the kids in the feeding program. What do you want me to do with them? Sell them. Whatever you get, give it all to the feeding program. I reluctantly agreed and went to my first pawn shop on Monday morning. Nothing like the TV show. <laughs> he told me they were old, the settings were bad, uh, they were dirty. He offered me 75, and then he said 100. I said no, and he said, okay, goodbye. Following Sunday, I told the story, and after the service, a man came up and said, do you have the rings? I said, yeah. I reached in my pockets. I thought he might be a jeweler. At least he could give me an estimate. He looked at them for a long time, turning them over in his hand. And he said, I will buy these rings under two conditions. What are they? He said, number one, all the money goes to the feeding program. I said, every penny. Number two, you will take the rings back to pastor and his wife. Tell them God has redeemed your Isaac from the altar. And he wrote me out a check for $2,000. <laughs> I went back to pastor and his wife and told them the story and handed them the rings. And they began to weep. And they wouldn't take them. Here's what they said. Do it again. I said, I don't do it again. We don't want them. I lost track and quit, quit keeping count of how many times the rings were bought and given back to me. I lost count at $257,000. What were the rings really worth? Maybe on a generous day, $150. There's a couple that's getting quite old now. They've never been on a mission trip because their church has never been large enough to send them. 
but on a given Sunday, they listened to the Holy Ghost and sacrificially gave. The day will come that they will stand on streets of gold and God will say this to them. When you gave your rings, I extended my arm. Watch. And God will look to the balconies and say, how many of you, your lives were changed because of their sacrificial gift? There will be thousands of Filipinos that will stand and come down. I will not offer to my God that which cost me nothing. In the mail and this morning you received when you came in from your church a faith promise card. Will you get it out? You're going to pass them out now? So ushers, if you're prepared to pass these out now, I just want you to look at this. If you, if you need one, just raise your hand. The number one question I get when I travel and speak about missions and faith promises is somebody wants to come up and say, what should I give? How much should I give? And my answer to them is always the same. Over here, I think, Pastor. How much should I give? And they, my answer is the same. I have no idea. But I can tell you this. If what you write down in this card doesn't cost you something, it's not what God intended you to give. I will not offer to my God that which cost me nothing. I want you to take a few minutes and just if you haven't already filled this out, if you filled it out, you may want to make some changes. This is between you and the Lord. Pastor and the missions board will never hunt you down and ask you where this support is. This is how your church is going to determine what it's going to be able to do to make an eternal difference in the lives of people around the world. So let's pray. Close your eyes. Holy Spirit, I've learned to trust you over the years. And your ways are so above my ways. God, I pray that as this church gateway fills out this card, that what we write on this card will be pleasing to you. For some in this room, it may be the very last time, the very last year that they'll ever be able to fill one of these out. So I pray that you will teach us to be obedient to you. I thank you for this church and its commitment to missions. Principalities and powers of the air, you must tremble to see how this church is committed to God's purpose. But you ain't seen anything yet. The best days of this church is ahead of them, not in their past. And as they grip your hand and they learn the power of sacrificial giving, nothing will be impossible to them. Not by might, not by power, by your spirit. Some trust in horses, and some trust in chariots, but I choose this day to trust in the name of the Lord, my God. Teach me the power of sacrificial giving. In Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. You know, church, many of you have heard parts of my story over the past several years. Some of you are new and haven't really heard. I made my first, my first, excuse me, faith promise when I was a teenager. I filled out a card very similar like this. It was for Speed the Light. It was for youth missions. And the pastor that was sharing, he said, you can give up a Big Mac a week, $2 a week times 52. So my first faith promise, he was encouraging that everyone could at least do that. I was kind of bold, young man. I said, I could do twice that. And ever since then, 
it was, I was probably 13, maybe 14 years old. I have made a faith promise every single year of my life. I was talking with Pastor Bob Roberts before, and he said, you know, he said, I was asking him about his giving journey a bit, and he said, every year it's a little bit more, a little bit more as you should do more. And, uh, and that's, pri- that's essentially been my story. And I just want to challenge us today. It's not so important about how much we put down, although it should be a sacrifice. And, and believe me, uh, the Lord this season has been uh, challenging me. I've shared this with Jessica. We have not decided how much we're going to do yet this year. Um, maybe second service, it'll come together. I've got some ideas. But, um, but I told her, I said, I feel like... <sighs> I feel like it's time to sacrifice again. And, and as God is my witness, we've been talking about this for two or three weeks. Because I've seen God move. And I've seen God make up the difference. I've seen God do things that in the natural do not make sense. But more than all of that, I want to just challenge every single person here to participate. We decided this year not to create a goal of a, an amount, instead a percentage. And I don't think it's too high. 100% participation. If you call the Gateway Church your home, this is what we do. We give. We give. Young people to the oldest among us we give. And so I'm going to ask as we continue this to worship the Lord, that if you're ready to make a faith promise, I'm going to ask that you would bring it to the altar as a sacrifice. And uh, ushers, if you could just bring the uh, receptacles kind of forward. And uh, what we do is we fill these out. We rip off the one part. You keep this part as a reminder and something to pray over and to ask God to help you with. This is what you'll put in. And uh, I don't see these. Uh, Someone from the missions board will gather these and we tally these. But listen, this is between you and God. And again, we're not going to be hounding you, coming after um, after you. But this is between you and God. And we want to give you this opportunity. And so let's do that. Lord, we just offer our lives to you. We offer our lives to you in these next few moments, God. I pray that you would do something supernatural in our midst, something beyond our wildest imagination. God, that 100% of those that are here, God, that, that they would participate, that we would do this together. And God, we will give you the praise, we will give you the glory, and God, we will worship you. And God, you are going to advance the gospel because of our gifts. God, we just love you, and we do this from the bottom of our heart. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. Let's participate. Let's stand together. Let's sing, and when you're ready, I want you to bring your faith promise to the Lord as a sacrifice. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Pete, if you could just gather these up. I want to pray over these. And uh, We'll be wrapped up here just momentarily. Thank you, Lord. Bless your name. Bless your name, O oh Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I just want you just to imagine what is represented in this giving receptacle. What's represented here are dreams. There is sacrifice here. There's momentum. But ultimately, what I want you to see is this, what we have just done, will translate into one more soul. One at a time. We are going to reach the lost. 
we are going to see lives changed for eternity. When you cross into eternity, there will be people in heaven because of what I'm holding right here. God, I'm so grateful for what you are doing. I'm so grateful, God, that you have called us to go above and beyond. You've called us, God, to do something out of our comfort zone. And God, we will give you the praise, the glory. We ask, God, that you would multiply every single gift this year. God, I pray that we would advance the gospel like we have never seen before. And we give you the praise, the glory, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. We love you. God bless you.